information here. Uh, this is a sort of modified presentation that I did earlier, and I'm going to uh, come up with some stuff to tell you guys that uh, nobody has ever heard before, or maybe not. All right. If my, uh, there we go, break principle and physics. You know what physics, some of you guys got a little bit uh, uh, tangled up with the physics part of it, and your Pascal's lost up this morning when you were doing your uh, online thing. Um, but everybody knows a lot. You think you got a lot of stuff here. You see, you got your master cylinder there, mm -hmm. and you got your brake pedal. You notice your brake pedal is mounted so that whenever you mash the brake, you got a maximum leverage because there's only a little bit of distance between here and there, and you got a long pedal coming off. All right, disc brake, drum brakes. Uh, a lot of people would complain about learning drum brakes because they claim they're a thing of the past, but that's not so because a lot of your newer pickups are coming out with drum brakes again. So drum brakes are not going anywhere, okay? And they're, they're actually, technically, drum brakes in some ways stop better than disc brakes. Now, disc brakes will get rid of water better than drum brakes will. You know, but disc brakes are uh, preferable for the front, basically. The brake lines are going through this little thing right here. We're going to talk about that. And then right here, you got a park brake, you know, which basically it doesn't look exactly like it's just sort of a generic thing. Okay, so you got power, you got weight, and you got velocity. And that's your kinetic energy. You know what the difference between potential and kinetic energy is? Potential versus kinetic energy. What do you got? What do you think? Potential energy is something that can happen. Kinetic energy is what is already happening. Right. And you're taking heat energy from your engine, and it's turning it into kinetic energy that's driving the wheels. And whenever you go to stop, you're taking kinetic energy and turning it into heat energy whenever you apply your brakes. That ain't real complicated. Uh, so zero to 60 miles an hour, you know, you got 10 seconds there. In other words, let's say that average you're going to take about 10 seconds to get from 0 to 60. From 60 to 0, you got to get there faster, 3 to 4, like that. And look at what the car is doing. Yeah. It's, you know, going down in the front. It's dipping. Now we talk about in steering and suspension, where's the best place to put a, a new pair of tires? If you're only going to put two new tires on your car, where's the best place to put them? On the front. On the back. back. Wow. Because if you put them on the front, you don't, you'll, have, you'll have a tendency to spin out. And uh, there's actually, you can basically look that up with Goodyear, Michelin, everybody, and even at Wall, at uh, Sam's Club. If you go to Sam's Club up there, they got a poster up there that says, put two new tires on your car, always put them on the back. Because if you put them on the front, it seems like the front ought to be where they go, but the back is going to give your car, uh, it ain't going to spin out. And go into it. You know. That's subject to uh, front wheel or real wheel drive vehicle. Correct? No, it doesn't make any difference. It's, it's better on the the best the big the best tires need to be on the rear regardless of where they're front or rear wheel drive. Uh, and that's what the tire manufacturers say. And this is the problem is if you put the tires the good ones on the front and you got some that are mostly wore out on the back and somebody crashes and it goes to court you're the one that's going to get hung out to dry because you put them on the front instead of the back. See what I'm saying? That's what you need to be thinking about. If the tire manufacturer says always put them on the back, you always put them on the back. It doesn't matter what you may think. They've done a heck of a lot of studies on that, and the best place for them is to be on the back. Okay, always. That was, I sort of got on the rabbit trail there. But, uh, let me see if I can get this thing to move forward. Actually, the brake pads, this ain't complicated. Your brake pads are basically pinching that disc and stopping them. Uh, so traction is going to vary with road service and tire condition. Better traction improves vehicle braking power. You got good traction. Have you ever been driving in the rain and hit the brake and it's, and it started sliding? What I mean, have you ever turned the wheels while it was sliding? What happens? Who knows? It just goes straight. It don't matter unless you're in something that it, so where the tires can act like a rudder. If you're on slick pavement and you hit the brakes and they start sliding, it don't matter what you do with your steering wheel, you're going to keep going in the same direction. That's what anti-lock brakes are all about, at least part of it. All right, so you got to have equal force side to side, and you got to have balanced force front to back. You don't want any uh, excitement there. Uh, there was this Cajun guy I mean, uh, called T-Boy that bought. Uh, you know how you noticed when you were doing those dual servo brakes, you had a short shoe and a long shoe? The lining was shorter on one shoe than it was the other. And uh, he called my friend David Hughes, 
And he says, I put brakes on my pickup and it had drums on all four wheels on that old truck. And he says, and whenever I go down the road and I hit the brake, I go back where I come from. And uh, so David went over and pulled the wheels off and he had put the two short ones on the right front and the left rear and the two long ones on the left front and the right rear. So when he hit the brake, it would swap ends out there on the road. And it's pretty important to make sure that it's equal for side to side. And you also have these, these lines, these hoses that connect the wheels to the brake system so that when you turn the wheel, you got to have them hoses where they can actually allow movement. And those hoses can... Now, how many of you guys have done brake pads and you let the caliper hang by the hose? Not good. That's not something you're supposed to do. But if you, what gets me is you can walk in a lot of these dealerships and you'll see mechanics doing brakes and they just got the caliper hanging by the hose. And ain't, that's not the way. You're always supposed to hook that, you know, that's something else support the weight of that caliper, not the hose. Okay? Okay, so you got... 12 pounds of force. This is going to expand on what you guys were doing later. Uh, you know, stay with me, Nick. All right, so 12 pounds of force is going to give you 48 pounds of lift. See that? Because why? You got 48 square inches of surface here, 12 square inches here. So that's Pascal's law, basically. You can't compress fluid. Fluid will expand and contract, but you can't compress it. Uh, when you put pressure here, you put equal pressure in every direction, all the way through your tube. No, that. So your input force is 100 pounds, got a one square inch piston, 200 pounds. You know, it only moves half as far, but with twice the force. You see, we were talking about that the other day when we were talking about gears. It's real similar to that, except it's hydraulics. If you've got half a big as piston here, it's going to move twice as far, but with only half the force. See what I'm saying? That's just a little bit of principle there. All right, so. You can have caked hoses. You can have hoses that are coming apart on the inside. Uh, occasionally, and actually, there was an ABS unit over that came off of a F-250 over there that we had. And if she had to do a panic stop, after she did a panic stop, the rear brakes wouldn't unlock. They would just stay locked. And she'd have to go back there and loosen the bleeders and let the pressure off. And then she could drive some more. And that turned out to be a bad ABS unit. Um, one time I got on one of these uh, Chevrolet pickups out here, I decided I was going to, you know, Delco used to make something called D-Clean. It was like a purple colored denatured alcohol. It was made for flushing brakes and doing other things. And so I said, well, I can do that with denatured alcohol. So I flushed out the brakes on one of these uh, college trucks with uh, denatured alcohol. And it caused the ABS units, a bunch of stuff broke loose on the inside of it, and it was locking the rear brakes up. So I had to replace the ABS unit. If you're going to flush the brake system, do it with, other, with brake fluid. You know, go with clean brake fluid if you're going to flush it out. And what, you remember that little strip I had you guys dip that changes color? Fast car, F-A-S-C-A-R. I don't know if you did that one or not. What is that? What's F-A-S? I think I was at the UF last time. F-A-S-C-A-R. What does that stand for? You remember? Fluid analysis by stimulation of copper alpha reactions. That one <laughs> okay. You can remember that, right? They'll be on the pop test tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> um, master cylinder, your foot, brake lines. You see what's going on, how we're applying Pascal Law here? This right here is your wheel cylinders. This right here is your front caliper, right? And you notice it's pinching the, this is the rotor right here, and it's pinching. And you got this caliper that's actually acting sort of like a C clip. Now I'm going to talk a second about brake fluid here. Not clean, <coughs> minimum, dry, 401. See now, if you, brake fluid is hygroscopic. And what that means is it very, uh, it loves to absorb water. And so when you take your top off your brake fluid and you pour it in the master cylinder, do not leave the top off of that brake fluid because it wants to get water in it. And that's going to change the properties of it, okay? If somebody's got a can of brake fluid that's had the top setting off over a couple of weeks out in their shed, you need to get some fresh brake fluid. Don't, you don't use that, you know. And see, the, the Ford Dot 3 is better than the Dot 3 minimum. They make sure they exceed all that. Okay, a newly opened can exceeds all minimum requirements. Damage to seals when Dot 5 fluid is mixed with Dot 3 fluid. we we'll talk about that for a minute. Dot 4 handles higher heat. If a car's manufacturer is calling for Dot 4, that means your manufacturer doesn't feel comfortable. The braking system will not raise the fluid above a temperature that Dot 3 can handle. So that's some Dot 4 fluid. You don't usually see that. Uh, don't use Dot 5. There's been reports of the damage. And furthermore, Dot 5 fluid, it's got silicone in it, it's supposed to make the rubber last longer. But when those ABS pistons in there are whipping around, you know, 
doing your brakes, it, it can whip that dot five fluid up into a foam and make it not stop. Uh, be careful with that. Always use, and see this crummy old fluid here? This is, see the, this looks like what we use out here in the shop. We've got that hose, one in the bottle, and all that. And you're taking, unless you're working on a trainer car, don't take the same fluid that you've pumped through the system and pour it back in there. You know what I mean? I always try to use new fluid every time. It's the best way to do it. You like that? That's cool, huh? Actually, I forgot that was there. I probably ought to turn down the speaker. Okay, lesson two, components and operation. All right, here's your reservoir. Yeah, I actually should have painted that the same color as that, but there's you. You got a secondary piston, you got a primary piston, right? Rubber cups right here, and this piston pushes this piston. All right, and so you basically are going, and I'll give you a little bit more on that. Uh, there's a tandem master cylinder, but all cars got it. There's two separate chambers, and they provide hydraulic pressure. Uh, two braking circuits for redundancy and safety. So, if one, uh, if you get a leak somewhere in one part of your brake circuit, it will still stop with the other part. Uh, there are there on a there was a Hudson, a 50 model Hudson that my buddy Donnie had over at his shop, and he had it up on the lift, and we were looking at it, and it actually had a mechanical set of brakes that back would back up the hydraulic ones if they failed. So if you if you hit your brakes and the hydraulic pressure was all gone, the mechanical brakes would kick in on that one. They kind of got away from that apparently. Now you got these right here. This is really important. I'll tell you why this is important to understand what you got there. There are some cases, you know, whenever you guys are doing a uh, bleeding that ranger, I was telling you, you go to the right rear wheel and then the left rear wheel and then the right front wheel and then the left front wheel. You got that? On uh, Gene Taylor's truck, uh, he had some body work done on that truck of his as a Nissan and the brake pedal never felt right because they bled it like we're talking about. Well, if you pulled up for that 08 Titan or whatever you drive, Frontier, I guess, uh, it's got an entirely different bleeding order on the <coughs> wheels. And when we bled it with the right order on the wheels, he had good brakes for the first time in a long time. But it was because you gotta pay attention to how these things are, I mean, how they're supposed to be bled because some are front and rear split and some are diagonally split. And if you try to bleed them all the same way, it's not going to work right. You won't get all your air out. Also, there's special procedures sometimes. Well, some of them, if they've got ABS with an ABS pump, you're supposed to turn on the scan tool and run the ABS pump. Or you may have to do something to the ABS to keep it from causing issues. Right? Not every time. You know, a lot of them just leave it normally. There's your tandem master cylinder. If you got a leak here, you'll have your braking force there. Okay. See if you if you bust a leak up this way. And I'll tell you something. I was telling one of you guys earlier. Whenever those pickup trucks have brake lines that are running inside the frame rail and somebody does a lot of mudding and that, and that uh, dirt lays up in there in the frame rail, those brake lines going through it, sooner or later you're going to hit the brake because them things are going to rust through and it's going to go like stepping on a plum. It's going to be squirting fluid and then you've got to get in there and fix the brake line. If you don't do it the right way, you're making it really dangerous. So be careful about that. Now there's typically a proportioning valve in the sense of prevent rear brake from sliding on most all these cars. What happens if you're going around, if you're going really fast around a curve in the rain or snow or something, and all of a sudden a deer runs across you and you have to hit the brake, you're going to spin out, ain't you? That's not too good. All right? And that's another reason you need the best tires on the back too. Okay, your tandem master cylinder, see how that one's hooked different? Uh, basically your braking force is going to be on these two. And these two right here would have lost their pressure. Now, when you hit that brake pedal, you got about 2,000 pounds of pressure going into those lines. So you got to fix brake lines the right way. That's why I was teaching you guys the double flare earlier. All right, here's the two chambers right here. Secondary return spring pushes it back. Primary return spring got a compensating port. Very important. I did brakes for years and years and years and years. And then I went to work over there with Ford, and they were wanting us to take these computerized tests on brakes. And the first time I took that computerized test on brakes, it was just a Ford Motor Company training thing, I bombed on that thing. And I was thinking, man, there's all kinds of stuff that I didn't know about brakes, even though I'd fixed brakes for years. But the problem is, there's little stuff that you're not told and that you don't ever see if all you do is just throw pads and shoes on it. See what I'm saying? And this is part of that. This is basically telling you what's going on in the master cylinder. So bear with me on this. All right. 
This right here, when the brakes are releasing, believe it or not, there's fluid that's coming past these right here. That looks like there's something wrong, doesn't it? That's really the way it's supposed to be. Now, whenever you're applying your brakes, you've gone past this compensating port and you've trapped this pressure in here in this pressure chamber and it's forcing it out of the wheel. Now, you've got two pistons in there and both of them pretty much work the same way. There's your secondary area and all that. All right, now, let me see if I can make this happen. All right, now, deal it with me here. Look at that. See? When you release your brakes, after it has let that fluid come back there, that compensating port lets it go back into the chamber. And see, there's your fluid inlet port. You're actually going to come back before that, too. But that releases the brakes, so when the brakes aren't being held, they're actually are able, whenever you <coughs> come back past that one, the brakes start to release as you're letting off and everything, uh, you know, you, and, that, and so on and so forth. This thing right here works about half the time. All right, and there's your compensating port. This is a different manufacturer's picture on that. You know, lets the fluid go back in there whenever the piston comes back. I'm not going to spend a long time on that. Okay, so your components in operation. You got your drum. You got your disc. There ain't nothing complicated about that. You got to. Does this look familiar to you guys, mm -hmm. Nicholas and, and you guys? This y'all have seen this, haven't you? Except that one just got one piston in it. All right, and these little. There's your bleeder screw. And uh, incidentally, here, let me tell you something about this. The little dust cap on the bleeder screw that you're going to see when you're working on somebody's car, don't lose that dust cap. Because I don't know at the times I've actually tried to bleed brakes whenever there was a bunch of crud stopping up that bleeder screw, and I had to run a drill bit down through there and clean all that junk out before I could bleed the dead gum brake. Also, you might notice this is on top. You can get a caliper, you can get the caliper back on there backwards so the bleeder screws are on the bottom and you will never get all the air out of there because the air is going up wanting to come out the top. But you can put them on the wrong way. You know, I've actually seen people when they couldn't get one for the uh, right side, they would put a left side one on there and they'd hold a, put a two by four or something in there and hold it up and bleed it that way and then they put it back down and messes everybody else up down the line. You got this right here, this caliper's got a float. Now look at that seal. This is something I didn't tell you guys before. See how whenever you're applying the brake, that seal distorts that square seal? And when you release the brake, that, squeal, that seal acts like a spring. There may be something on your final about this, so don't, uh, don't diss me on that. Okay? Maybe let me get through with class and I'll call you back. All right. All right, internally vented rotor. What does that mean? See the little vents? Where do you usually see these? Front or rear? Front. Front. And these will be on the rear. The ones on the rear won't be as thick and they won't be vented. Why? Isolate on Well, because, yeah, every, the, the shifts forward. You get, the brake front ones are working harder. All right, now the caliper, you've seen this. This look familiar? You've seen this already, see? See what I'm saying with that? That right there, this, these right here, whenever somebody put that back together, and that truck didn't get driven that much, they left that boot out of place, and moisture got up in there, and it seized this darn thing up where we had a booger of time getting it out of there. You know what I mean? If the caliper doesn't slide smoothly, the pads will work unevenly. The caliper is supposed to work like a C-clamp. Basically, see what I mean? All right, so, and you ever seen pads that were like that? Like a wedge? That's because the caliper's not floating right. One side, the side that's got the piston on it's going to wear a lot while, and because the caliper can't pull on the other side, <coughs> on the opposite side of the rotor won't wear hardly at all. So here's the problem. Guys will take a flashlight when they're under there looking at the brake so that maybe they can't see them from the outside because of what kind of wheels on it. And they'll look at it on the inside, or maybe they'll look at it standing out here through the wheel. And if you're looking at the side that doesn't have the piston on it, you'll think you've got good brakes, and they'll be near about war slam out on the other side. You need to look at both pads, okay? All right. Now this right here is a strange kind of a park brake mechanism, <laughs> and you actually, when you're putting this is on the rear caliper integrated park brake. When you put pads on one of these, you are going to have to use a special tool to screw that back in. You can't just push it back in. It's got to be screwed back in. Okay. 
And this is the kind of the innards of it, what it looks like and all that. We've got a thrust screw. All right, and then you, this is the kind I like the best. The, uh, the Chevrolets that have, uh, you know, pickups that have the disc brakes on the rear, they got a hat, the Crown Vicky and the all, they got a hat with that rotor, so you got these little park brakes inside the hat, and then you got disc brakes out here that'll do your, your stuff. They call it a hat because it looks like a hat, okay? Now this right here, this look familiar to you guys? You did this too, didn't you? You pull the, these wheel cylinders apart, you got the, the cups and these boots and that spring, all that. Now we used to, whenever we used to work on them things, we would actually, uh, uh, well, we did drum brakes back in the 70s, mid-70s when I started uh, working. I worked at my dad's shop, and then I did, you know, went into work at an independent shop, and then I moved on up the line from there. But at that shop, uh, we would, every time we did brakes, we would pull the uh, shoes off and everything, pull the wheel cylinders apart and hone them, and then we would put new cups and everything. We, you actually rebuilt the wheel cylinders every time you did a brake job on all four wheels. That was just part of the deal. Now you can buy a wheel cylinder for like seven or eight bucks. They don't cost very much. Now, don't neglect to learn this. What kind of brakes have y'all been doing on the table? Duo servo. Duo servo is what this is. There's leading trailing. All right. Now you might notice your leading trailing is anchored on the bottom and the, and the, and the uh, wheel cylinder is on the top. Okay. So trail and shoe make contact with the drum here, but the rotation of the drum forces the shoe away. Leading shoe makes contact with the drum here, and the, you know you need to stop going forward and backwards. So either way it works. All right, and there's your dual servo. There's your little short landing. Your short landing is basically going to energize that back one, and it's basically going to do more of the stopping. But the, if you put them on there the wrong way, they've actually got different kind of landing they put on this shoe than on that one too. And I might notice too, you got your little adjuster on the bottom, the, the, the dual servo on the bottom kind of swings on the bottom, and it's anchored on the bottom on the other. And look at your, that's a funky one shot adjuster. You probably won't ever see one of those. I don't even know why that slide in there. But this is a leading trailing. See, it's anchored at the bottom and the adjuster's up here. All right, this one here is your dual servo incremental adjuster. Some of you guys have already seen this. You got, and they're done various different ways. Some of them have got that spring hooking into that same deal instead of having another little spring. Uh, but anyway, there's your little star wheel for the adjust in the front. And this one right here, you notice if the adjuster is on top and it's anchored on the bottom, that's your leading trailing incremental adjuster. That's what it looks like on the car. And you'll see those fairly regularly. Usually they have a little back. Now these are your brake booster. This is important. So pay attention to what's going on here. You got a diaphragm return spring. You got a supported diaphragm. You got a rear shell. Master cylinder push rod. That's where your brake pedal goes. And there's, they got this really sort of laid in there sideways, but usually, you know, this little uh, vacuum check valve will be up at the top of the cylinder. You'll see it. All right. You got low pressure, low pressure. Everything is equal. There's no brakes being applied here. There's an atmospheric port inside this thing, and a vacuum port is open. So it lets vacuum be on both sides of the diaphragm. Now pay attention to what happens when I move on to the next slide. Look at that. The vacuum port closed. You stopped vacuum from going back here. Your atmospheric port's open. And now what you got here? You got vacuum here and you got atmospheric pressure coming in through that. You might even notice where the thing goes through there. It's got a bunch of little holes. It's got foam in them. It lets atmospheric pressure go in there. And when you've got less pressure here and more pressure here, you got this big diaphragm. That's why that brake booster is like this big around because you need a lot of square inches, right? So it's pushing on the brakes. All right, and there it is whenever you're in a situation, if it's in a holding position, uh, you're basically keeping everything static there. I'm not going to go into a lot of that. Um, that's, and I will tell you, brake boosters can go bad where you'll hear vacuum leaking inside the car when you hit the brake. You know, and that's a problem there. Also, when a brake booster dies, you know, you like you don't, how can you check the brake booster? What I'm going to do, if I want to check a brake booster and see if it's working, is I'm going to switch off the car and I'm going to pump the brake a few times to dump the vacuum. I'm going to put my foot on the brake and I'm going to crank it up and we'll see if the brake goes down. I ain't talking about the floor, but if it goes down, that means your brake booster is working, okay? You can just demonstrate this by taking the vacuum line off the brake booster and stopping it up with something. Pump the brake up, crank the car, it won't move. That's one way you can tell. It's fairly easy to do. Hydraulic brake booster systems work off of the power steering pump. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that right now. You got a reservoir, you got a steering valve and all that stuff, you know. 
uh, receives pressure from the pump and it contains a brake booster valve. And it typically has got an accumulator so that you'll have an extra um, application of the brake as a safety feature. Now you got a proportioning valve here. Have you ever seen one of these? If you ever look, you'll see one on the car. We worked on a Sebring one time that the rear brakes were all rusty and weren't even being applied. They were disc brakes and it had a bad valve. It wasn't even letting any fluid go back to the rear brake. Of course, she was stopping okay, but she wondered why her rotors were rusty on that. All right. So you got a hydraulic pressure from primary cylinder, a metering valve, and a proportioning valve. These things are kind of close to the same thing, really. Proportioning valve is used to regulate brake force in the rear brake system. Metering valve is used to equalize hydraulic pressure on vehicles that use front uh, disc and rear drum brakes. Uh, so, all right. Now, you ever seen one of these under a car and wondered what in the world it was doing there? Or under a pickup, like a Nissan pickup or Ford Taurus or something like that? Height sensing proportioning valve. The more weight you put in the back, the more brake pressure goes to the back wheels. It changes the properties of the brake system as you load it heavier. All right, not on every vehicle, but on some of them it does. And this is sort of a little rundown on how the master cylinder goes through that little proportioning valve, and, and that's really important. That's actually what, if you've blown one of them lines and you hit the brake and it moves that little proportioning valve to the side, it'll light the brake warning light. And this right here, this is what they look like on the car, sort of. This goes to the left front, right front, the rear, and the brake warning light hooks up right there. But the ABS system incorporates all this stuff, okay? And then you got a shuttle valve. I ain't going to dig into a lot of that. It's a safety valve. It's full pressure of the rear brakes if the front brakes fell to leak. And so, and you know, you don't usually see a whole lot of that. Now, here's some of the stuff you can do. You can have a leaking booster. You can have a parking brake that's got cables all seized up. That's great fun. We worked on a Ranger one time, and I guess that guy had drove that thing in the creek a lot or something, crossing a creek, because every, every part of the park brake system was locked slam up, and all the springs were so rusty, we had to replace all the hardware and everything. Um, common brake system is our worn pad lining. You see that all the time. Clogged brake hose. Now here's how that feels. You hit the brake and it pulls one way, and then the longer you hit the brake, it comes back straight. It's actually slowing the fluid down going to one of the front brakes. And I've got a, a set of gauges over here you can put where the pad goes and match the brake and see if they both match. See what I'm saying? It's like three or four thousand pounds of pressure. It actually is putting on them brake pads when it matches it. If you're ever working on a hybrid vehicle, some of the hybrid vehicles, the Ford ones, um, it may decide if you have to disable the hybrid system that it's just going to apply the brakes and check everything out. If you get your hand in the wrong place, Katie barred the door. You know, you lost a couple of fingers. You know, be careful with that. Uh, warrant, there's actually a fuse you're supposed to pull when you're doing brakes on one of those. So it doesn't pop the piston out of there. Uh, so, you know, you can do that. Uh, you can actually have brake pedal, push rod, or return spring, or bushing problems up here. Leaking master cylinder. If you see a little bit of fluid trickling down the front of the booster, that's not necessarily the kiss of death for the master cylinder. But here's what a bad master cylinder feels like. I'm pulling up here and I'm stopping, and I feel like I got a good hard pedal. But as I'm sitting in the light waiting for it to turn, my put my foot's falling out. From, you know, my brake's falling out from under my foot, and I got to get another grab. That's a bad master cylinder, guy. You felt that before? No, I'm just I'm yeah. listening to what you're yeah. saying. But what I mean is, if you, you're going to feel it sooner or later. Somebody's going to say, hey, my brakes don't feel right. You hit the brake initially, you think it's fine, but if you sit there with the engine idling and you feel the pedal going down, and this one guy came and he said, hey, man, he said, I've got all kinds of brake fluid I'm having to pour in here all the time, but I don't see any coming out on the ground. Well, when I pull the master cylinder off the booster, I saw a bunch of it in the booster, and we poured about a quart of fluid out of the brake booster. Had to put a brake booster on it, too. All right, proportioning valve. Sometimes the proportioning valve just looks, it's just in the line back there. It's a little thing. It almost looks like a, a little fitting or something that's about that long that brake lines go into and all that. That old mobile's got some of those on it. And you've got to make sure when you're machining the rotors, before you machine the brake rotors, you're supposed to take a micrometer, find out what the minimum pad thick or, or rotor thickness is. If it's too thin, don't do it. Uh, Alan Cobb was driving his little Toyota that had had the brake rotors wherever he was having his brakes worked on. Had been machined every time without measuring it. And when his pads got to a certain thickness, he hit the brakes once. He had brakes. He hit the brakes next time. The pads shot out of there, and he lost all his brakes. And he was in a turn lane, and there was a big truck coming. Wah! You know, that's always scary to get out. 
All right, make sure you understand the symptom, determine which system on the vehicle could be causing the concern, determine the component within that system's faulty, and determine what caused it to fail. If you don't determine what caused it to fail, it's going to come back on you. Okay?